In truth, pure metaphysics is neither Eastern nor Western, but universal, being in essence above and beyond all forms and all contingencies. It is only the exterior forms in which it is clothed in order to serve the necessities of exposition, so as to express whatever is expressible, that can be either Eastern or Western. But beneath their diversity, there is always and everywhere a self-same basis, at least wherever true metaphysics exists, and this for the simple reason that truth is one. If this be so, what need is there to speak specifically of Eastern metaphysics? The reason is that in the present intellectual state of the Western world, metaphysics is a thing forgotten, generally unknown, and more or less entirely lost, whereas in the East, it still remains the object of an effective knowledge. If one wishes to know metaphysics, therefore, one must turn to the East. And even if one's wish is to recover some of the metaphysical traditions that may once have existed in the West, a West that was in many respects much closer to the East than it is today, it is above all with the help of Eastern doctrines and by comparison with them that one may succeed, because these are the only teachings in the domain of metaphysics that can still be studied directly. But in order to do so, it is quite clear that they must be studied as the Easterners themselves study them, and not in giving oneself over to more or less hypothetical and occasionally wholly fantastical interpretations. It is also too often forgotten that the Eastern civilizations still exist, and that they still have qualified representatives to whom one need only apply in order to learn the true nature of the subject. I have said Eastern metaphysics, and not exclusively Hindu metaphysics, for doctrines of this order, with all they imply, are not to be found only in India, contrary to what some people believe, who in any case have but a poor understanding of their true nature. The case of India is by no means exceptional in this respect. It is precisely that of all civilizations that possess what might be called a traditional foundation. What is exceptional and abnormal, rather, are those civilizations which lack such a foundation. And in all truth, the only one known to us is that of the modern West. To take only the principal Eastern civilizations, in China the equivalent of Hindu metaphysics can be found in Taoism. Elsewhere it can be found in certain esoteric schools of Islam. It should be understood, furthermore, that this Islamic esoterism has nothing in common with the overt philosophy of the Arabs, which is for the most part of Greek inspiration. The only difference is that everywhere but in India, these doctrines are reserved for a relatively restricted and insular elite. This was also the case in the West during the Middle Ages, for an esoterism similar in many respects to that of Islam, and just as purely metaphysical, but of which the moderns for the most part do not even suspect the existence. In India, it is not possible to speak of esoterism in the strict sense of the word, because there one does not find doctrines with the two aspects, exoteric and esoteric. One can only speak of a natural esoterism in the sense that each individual will reach just those depths or go just so far into the doctrine as his own intellectual capacities allow because for certain human individuals there are limitations inherent in their very nature that are impossible for them to overcome. Naturally, forms differ from one civilization to another, since they must adapt to different conditions. Although more familiar myself with the Hindu forms, I have no qualms in employing others as need arises if they can further the understanding of certain points. There is nothing problematic in this since they are only different expressions of the same thing. Once again, truth is one, and it is the same for all who, by whatever way, come to know it. This being said, it should now be made clear just what is meant by the word metaphysics, and all the more so since I have frequently had occasion to note that everyone does not understand it in quite the same way. I think the best course to take in dealing with words that might give rise to ambiguity is to restore to them as much as possible their primal and etymological meaning. Now, according to its composition, the word metaphysics means literally beyond physics, taking the word physics in the accepted sense it always had for the ancients, that is to say as knowledge of nature, in its widest sense. Physics is the study of all that pertains to the domain of nature. Metaphysics, on the other hand, 
is the study of what lies beyond nature. How, then, can some people claim that metaphysical knowledge is natural knowledge, either in respect of its object or with regard to the faculties by which it is obtained? Here we have a complete misconception, a contradiction in terms. And yet what is more amazing is that this confusion affects even those who should preserve some idea of true metaphysics and know how to distinguish it clearly from the pseudo-metaphysics of modern philosophers. But perhaps one might say that if the word metaphysics gives rise to such confusion, would it not be better to abandon it and replace it with something more suitable? In reality, this would cause problems, since by its formation, this word is perfectly suited for that to which it refers. Moreover, it would hardly be possible, seeing that Western languages possess no other word equally well adapted to this usage. It is out of the question to use the word knowledge, pure and simple, as is done in India, although this is indeed knowledge, par excellence, the only kind truly worthy of the name, because it would only make things more confusing for Westerners who habitually associate knowledge with nothing outside the scientific and rational domain. And in any event, is it necessary to be so concerned over the abuse made of one word? If all such words had to be rejected, how many would remain at our disposal? Is it not sufficient to take precautions to avoid misunderstandings and misrepresentations? We are no more attached to the word metaphysics than to any other, but until a better term is suggested to take its place, we will continue to use it as before. Unfortunately, there are people who think they can judge that of which they are ignorant, and who, and because they apply the name metaphysics to a purely human and rational knowledge, which for us is merely science or philosophy, imagine that Eastern metaphysics is nothing more nor other than that, whence they draw the logical conclusion that this metaphysics cannot truly lead to any particular results. Yet it does indeed lead to such results, but only because it is something quite other than they supposed. Now what they envisage really has nothing to do with metaphysics, since it is only knowledge of a natural order, a knowledge that is profane and superficial. This is definitely not what we wish to discuss. Do we then make metaphysical synonymous with supernatural? We would willingly accept such an assimilation, since, as long as we do not go beyond nature, that is to say the manifest world in all its extension, and not only the perceptible world, which is but one infinitesimal element of it, we remain in the realm of the physical. What is metaphysical, as we have already said, is that which lies beyond and above nature, and is thus, properly speaking, supernatural. But here an objection will undoubtedly be raised. Is it possible, then, to go beyond nature? We do not hesitate to answer plainly. Not only is it possible, but it is done. But those are just words, it will be said. What proofs can you give us? It is truly strange that people ask for proof concerning the possibility of a kind of knowledge, instead of searching for it and verifying it for themselves by undertaking the work necessary to acquire it. For those who possess this knowledge, what interest can there be in all this discussion? Substituting a theory of knowledge for knowledge itself is perhaps the greatest admission of impotence in modern philosophy. Moreover, all certitude contains something incommunicable. No one can truly attain to any knowledge other than through a strictly personal effort, and all that one can do for another is to provide an opportunity and indicate the means by which to attain it. That is why it would be vain to attempt to impose any belief in the purely intellectual realm. In this respect, the best argument in the world cannot replace direct and effective knowledge. Now, can metaphysics as we understand it be defined? No, for to define is always to limit, and what is under consideration is, in and of itself, truly and absolutely limitless, and thus cannot be confined to any formula or any system whatsoever. Metaphysics might be partially characterized, for example, by saying that it is the knowledge of universal principles, but this is not a definition in the proper sense, and in any case only conveys a fairly vague notion. Something can be added by saying that the scope of these principles is far greater than was thought by some Westerners, who, although really studying metaphysics, did so in a partial and incomplete way. Thus, when Aristotle considered metaphysics as a knowledge of being as being, he identified it with ontology. 
which is to say that he took the part for the whole. For Eastern metaphysics, pure being is neither the first nor the most universal of principles, for it is already a determination. It is thus necessary to go beyond being, and it is this that is of the greatest importance. This is why, in all truly metaphysical conceptions, allowance must always be made for the inexpressible, and just as everything that can be expressed is literally nothing in comparison with that which surpasses expression, so the finite, whatever its magnitude, is as nothing to the infinite. One can intimate much more than one can express, and ultimately, this is the part played by exterior forms. All such forms, whether words or symbols, merely constitute supports, footholds from which to rise to possibilities of conception that transcend them immeasurably. We will return to this point later. We speak of metaphysical conceptions for lack of any other term whereby to make ourselves understood, but this should not be taken to mean that here is something comparable to scientific or philosophic conceptions. It is not a question of affecting some sort of abstraction, but of attaining direct knowledge of reality as it is. Science is rational, discursive knowledge, always indirect. A knowledge by reflection. Metaphysics is a supra-rational, intuitive, and unmediated knowledge. Moreover, this pure intellectual intuition without which there is no true metaphysics, has no connection with the intuition spoken of by certain contemporary philosophers, which is, on the contrary, infrarational. There is an intellectual intuition, and a sensible intuition. The one is beyond reason, but the other is within it. The latter can know only the world of change and becoming, that is to say of nature, or rather of a minute part of nature. The realm of intuition, on the contrary, is that of eternal and immutable principles, the metaphysical realm. To comprehend universal principles directly, the transcendent intellect must itself be of a universal order. It is no longer an individual faculty, and to consider it as such would be contradictory, because it is not within the power of the individual to go beyond its own limits or to step outside the conditions that limit it as an individual. Reason is wholly and specifically a human faculty, but what lies beyond reason is truly non-human. It is what makes metaphysical knowledge possible, and this knowledge, it must be reaffirmed, is not a human knowledge. In other words, it is not as man that man can attain it, but as that being which is human in one of its aspects and at the same time is something other, more than a human being. And it is the attainment of effective awareness of super-individual states that is the real object of metaphysics, or better still, of metaphysical knowledge itself. Thus, we arrive at one of the most essential points, which it is necessary to stress. If the individual were a complete being, if it constituted a closed system, in the manner of Leibniz's monad, metaphysics would not be possible. Irremediably closed in on itself, such a being would have no means of becoming aware of anything outside its own order of existence. But such is not the case. In reality, the individual represents but one transitory and contingent manifestation of the true being. It is but one specific state among an indefinite multitude of states of the same being, and that being is in itself absolutely independent of all its manifestations, just as, to use an analogy that appears frequently in Hindu texts, the sun is absolutely independent of the many images in which it is reflected. Such is the fundamental distinction between self and ego, the personality and the individuality. And just as the images are connected by the luminous rays to the solar source, without which they would have neither existence nor reality, so the individuality, either of the human individual or of any analogous state of manifestation, is bound by the personality to the principial center of being by this transcendent intellect of which we have just spoken. Within the limits of this exposition, it is impossible to develop such considerations more fully, or to give a more exact idea of the theory of the multiple states of being. But I think I have said enough to give at least a sense of the paramount importance of any truly metaphysical doctrine. I said theory, but it is not only a question of theory, and this is yet another point that requires clarification. Theoretical knowledge, which is still only indirect and in some way symbolic, is merely a preparation, 
although indispensable, for true knowledge. It is, moreover, the only knowledge that is in any way communicable, and this is why all exposition is but a means of approaching knowledge, which, being only virtual in the beginning, must later be effectively realized. Here we find another difference from the more limited metaphysics to which we referred earlier, that of Aristotle, for instance, which remains theoretically inadequate in that it limits itself to being, and in which, moreover, theory seems to be presented as self-sufficient rather than expressly bound up with a corresponding realization, as is the case in all Eastern doctrines. And yet, even in this imperfect metaphysics, we might be tempted to call it a demi-metaphysics. Statements sometimes are encountered which, had they been properly understood, should have led to entirely different conclusions. Thus, did not Aristotle specifically state that a being is all that it knows? This affirmation of identification through knowledge is the very principle of metaphysical realization. But here the principle remains isolated, its value merely that of a wholly theoretical statement. It carries no weight, and it seems that, after having been propounded, it is no longer even thought of. How was it that Aristotle himself and his followers failed to see all that was implied therein? Admittedly, the same holds true in many other cases, where they seem to have forgotten other equally essential things, such as the distinction between pure intellect and reason, even after having defined them no less explicitly. Such lapses are strange indeed. Should one see in this the effect of certain limitations inherent in the Western mind, apart from some rare but always possible exceptions? This might be true to a certain extent, yet it is not necessary to believe that Western intellectuality has always been as narrowly limited as it is in the present age. However, such doctrines are only outward after all. For our part, we are certain that there was in antiquity and in the Middle Ages more than this in the West, that there were available to the elite doctrines of a purely metaphysical nature that could be called complete, including that realization which for most moderns is certainly a thing barely conceivable. If the West has lost its memory of such teachings so completely, it is because it has broken with its own tradition, and this is why modern civilization is an abnormal and deviant one. If purely theoretical knowledge were itself its own end, and if metaphysics went no further, it would still assuredly be worth something, but it would be altogether insufficient. In spite of conferring the genuine certainty, even greater than mathematical certainty, that belongs to such knowledge, it would remain analogous to that certainty which at an inferior level constitutes terrestrial and human, scientific and philosophical speculation, although in an incomparably superior order. That is not what metaphysics should be, let others dabble in mental sport, or in what passes for such, that is their affair. But such things as these are of no interest to us, and we think moreover that the inquisitiveness of the psychologist must remain entirely alien to the metaphysician. For the latter, what matters is to know what is, and to know it in such a manner that one is truly and effectively the sum total of what one knows. As for the means of metaphysical realization, we are well aware of such objections as can be made by those who believe it their duty to contest the possibility of such realization. These means indeed must be within man's reach. They must, in the first stages at least, be adapted to the conditions of the human state, since this is the state in which the being actually finds itself and from which it must subsequently take possession of the higher states. We see no difficulty in recognizing that there is no common measure between metaphysical realization and the means leading to it, or, if one prefers, that prepare for it. Furthermore, that is why none of these means are strictly or absolutely necessary, or at least there is only one truly indispensable preparation, and that is theoretical knowledge. On the other hand, the latter could not go very far without a means that should thus be considered as playing the most important and constant part, which means is concentration, something completely foreign, even contrary to the mental habits of the modern West, where everything tends toward dispersion and incessant change. All other means are secondary in relation to this one. They serve above all to promote concentration and to harmonize the diverse elements of human individuality in order to facilitate effective communication between this individuality 
and the higher states of the being. From the very start, moreover, these means can be almost indefinitely varied, for they have to be adapted to the temperament of each individual and to his particular aptitudes and dispositions. Thereafter, the differences diminish, for it is a case of multiple paths all leading to the same end. At a certain stage, all multiplicity disappears, but at that stage, the individual and contingent means will have played their part. This part, which it is unnecessary to enlarge upon, is compared in certain Hindu writings to a horse that helps a man to reach the end of his journey more quickly and easily, but without which he could still reach it. Rites and various methods point the way to metaphysical realization, but one could nevertheless set them aside, and by unswervingly setting the mind and all powers of the being on the aim of this realization, could finally attain the supreme goal. But, if there are means that make the effort less laborious, why choose to neglect them? Is it confusing the contingent and the absolute to take into account the conditions of our human state, since it is from this state, itself contingent, that we are at present obliged to set forth in conquest of the higher states, and finally of the supreme and unconditioned state? Having considered the teachings common to all traditional doctrines, let us now turn to the principal stages of metaphysical realization. The first, which to a certain extent is merely preliminary, operates in the human domain and does not extend beyond the limits of the individuality. It consists of an indefinite extension of that individuality, of which the corporeal modality, the only modality developed in the ordinary man, represents but the smallest portion. In fact, one must start from the corporeal modality, whence the use in the beginning of means borrowed from the sensible order which means must have repercussions throughout the other modalities of the human being. In short, the phase in question is the realization or development of all the potentialities contained virtually within the human individuality, constituting multiple prolongations thereof, that reach out in diverse directions beyond the corporeal and sensible realm. And it is by means of these prolongations that it is possible to establish communication with the other states, this realization of the integral individuality is described by all traditions as the restoration of what is called the primordial state, which is regarded as the state of true man, and which already escapes some of the limitations characteristic of the ordinary state, notably those due to the temporal condition. The being that has attained this primordial state is still only a human individual and is without effective possession of any supra-individual states. Nevertheless, he is henceforth liberated from time, the apparent succession of things having been transmuted for him into simultaneity. He is in conscious possession of a faculty unknown to the ordinary man, which might be called the sense of eternity. This is of extreme importance, for he who cannot rise above the vantage point of temporal succession and envisage all things in simultaneous mode is incapable of the least conception of the metaphysical order. The first thing to be done by those who wish to achieve true metaphysical understanding is to step outside time, we would willingly say into non-time, if such an expression did not seem too peculiar and unusual. This knowledge of the intemporal can, moreover, be achieved in some real measure, if incompletely, before one has attained the fullness of the primordial state of which we have just spoken. Perhaps it will be asked why this designation primordial state it is because all traditions, including that of the West, for the Bible itself says nothing different, are in accord in teaching that this was originally the normal state for humanity, while the present state is merely the result of a decline, the effect of a kind of progressive materialization occurring down the ages and throughout the duration of a particular cycle. We do not believe in evolution in the sense the moderns have given the word. The so-called scientific hypotheses they have devised in no way correspond to reality. In any case, it is not possible here to make more than a passing mention of the theory of cosmic cycles, which is particularly expounded in the Hindu doctrines. To do so would be to go beyond our subject, for cosmology is not metaphysics, although it depends closely upon it. Cosmology is no more than an application of metaphysics to the physical order, while the true natural laws are only the consequences, in a relative and contingent domain, of universal and necessary principles. 
but let us return to metaphysical realization. Its second phase corresponds to supra-individual states which are still conditioned, although their conditions are completely different from those of the human state. Here the human world, in which we remained in the preceding stages, has been entirely and definitively left behind. It must also be added that what has been left behind is the world of forms in its most general sense, comprising all possible individual states. For form is the condition common to all such states, by which individuality is defined as such. The being, which can no longer be called human, is henceforth free from the current of forms, to use a Far Eastern expression. There are, moreover, further distinctions to be made, for this stage can be subdivided. In reality, it includes several stages, from the acquisition of states which, though non-formal, still belong to manifested existence, to the stage of universality, which is that of pure being. Nevertheless, as elevated as these states are when compared to the human state, and as remote as they may be from it, they are still only relative, and this is true even of the highest among them, which corresponds to the principle of all manifestation. The possession thereof is thus only a transitory result that should not be confused with the ultimate goal of metaphysical realization, which lies beyond being, and in comparison with which all the rest is but a journey and preparation. This supreme goal is the absolutely unconditioned state, set free from all limitation. For this very reason, it is completely inexpressible, and anything we might say about it must be put in the form of a negation, the negation of all limits that determine and define all existence in its relativity. The attainment of this state is what the Hindu doctrine calls deliverance when considering it in relation to conditioned states, and union when envisaged in relation to the supreme principle. Moreover, all other states of the being can in principle be found in this unconditioned state, but transformed, disengaged from the particular conditions that determine them as special states. What subsists is everything that has a positive reality, since it is there that everything has its principle. The delivered being is truly in possession of the fullness of its own potentialities. What have disappeared are merely the limiting conditions, of which the reality is negative, since they represent no more than a privation in the Aristotelian sense of the word. Thus, far from being a kind of annihilation, as some Westerners believe, this final state is on the contrary absolute plenitude, the supreme reality compared to which all else is but illusion. Let us add, too, that every result, even partial, obtained by the being in the course of metaphysical realization is obtained definitively. For this being, the result is a permanent acquisition that nothing can ever take from it. The work accomplished in this order even if interrupted before it is completed, is achieved once and for all by the very fact that it is outside of time. This is true even of simple theoretical knowledge, for all knowledge carries its benefit within it, in this way quite different from action, which is but a momentary modification of the being, and is always distinct from its own effects. Furthermore, these effects are of the same domain and the same order of existence as that which has produced them action cannot effectively liberate from action, and its consequences cannot reach beyond the limits of individuality, even when this is considered in its fullest possible extension. Action of any sort, not being opposed to the ignorance that is the root of all limitation, cannot dispel that ignorance. Only knowledge can dispel ignorance, as sunlight disperses shadow, and it is at this point that the self the immutable and eternal principle of all manifested and unmanifested states, appears in its supreme reality. After this brief and very imperfect sketch, which provides only the weakest notion of what metaphysical realization might be, it is absolutely essential to stress one point in order to avoid grave errors of interpretation. Nothing referred to here has any connection whatsoever with phenomena of any kind, however extraordinary they may be. All phenomena are of the physical order. Metaphysics is beyond phenomena, even taking the word in its widest sense. Among other consequences, it follows from this that the states to which we are referring are in no way psychological. 
This must be stated plainly, since strange confusions sometimes arise in this connection. By very definition, psychology can be concerned only with human states, and even then, as it is understood today, it reaches to only a very limited part of the individual's potentialities, which include far more than practitioners of this science could ever suspect. Indeed, the human individual is both much more and much less than is generally supposed in the West. Much more, by reason of his possibilities of indefinite extension beyond the corporeal modality, to which, in short, everything belongs, that is commonly studied, but he is also much less, since far from constituting a complete and self-sufficient being. He is but an outward manifestation, a fleeting appearance assumed by the true being, which in no way affects the essence of the latter in its immutability. It must be emphasized that the metaphysical domain lies entirely outside the phenomenal world, for by dint of habit, the moderns hardly ever recognize or investigate anything but phenomena, in which their interests lie almost exclusively. As the attention they have given to the experimental sciences bears witness, and their metaphysical inaptitude stems from the same tendency. Undoubtedly, it may happen that certain particular phenomena may occur during the labor of metaphysical realization, but in a wholly accidental manner. This is a rather unfortunate result, as occurrences of this sort can only be an impediment to those who might be tempted to attach some importance to them. Those who allow themselves to be stopped or turned aside by phenomena, and above all, those who indulge in the search for extraordinary powers, have very little chance of pressing their realization any further than the degree already achieved before this deviation occurred. This observation leads naturally to the correction of some erroneous interpretations on the subject of the term yoga. Indeed, has it not been claimed that what the Hindus indicate by this word is the development of certain powers latent in the human being? What we have just said suffices to demonstrate that such a definition is to be rejected. In reality, the word yoga is the same as that which we have translated as literally as possible by the word union. What it properly defines is thus the supreme goal of metaphysical realization. And the yogi, in the strictest sense of the term, is solely the person who attains this end. However, it is true that in some cases, the same terms may be applied by extension to stages preparatory to union, or even to simple preliminary techniques, as well as to the being that has reached the states corresponding to such stages or that uses those teachings to reach them. But how can it be maintained that a word having the primary meaning of union designates in its proper and original application breathing exercises or other things of that sort? Such exercises, and others generally based on what we might call the science of rhythm, do indeed figure among the means most widely practiced in promoting realization. But one must not mistake as an end that which amounts to no more than a contingent and accidental means, nor must one confuse the original meaning of a word with a secondary acceptation that is more or less distorted. In referring to the original yoga, and in saying that this word has always meant essentially the same thing, we might be prompted to pose a question regarding which we have as yet said nothing. What is the origin of these traditional metaphysical doctrines from which we have borrowed all our fundamental ideas? The answer is very simple. Although it risks raising objections from those who would prefer to consider everything from an historical point of view, and the answer is that there is no origin, by which we mean no human origin, that can be determined in time. In other words, the origin of tradition, if indeed the word origin has any place at all in such a case, is as non-human as is metaphysics itself. Doctrines of this order did not appear at any particular moment in the history of humanity. The allusion we have made to the primordial state, and also what we have said of the timeless nature of all that concerns metaphysics, should enable us to grasp this point without too much difficulty, on condition that we concede, contrary to certain prejudices, that there are some things to which the historical point of view does not apply. Metaphysical truth is eternal, and by that very fact, there have always existed beings able to know it truly and completely. What changes is only external forms and contingent means, and the change has nothing to do with what people today call evolution. 
It is simply an adaptation to such and such particular circumstances, to special conditions of some given race or age. From this springs the multiplicity of forms, but the foundation of the doctrine is no more modified and affected by it than the essential unity and identity of the being is altered by the multiplicity of its states of manifestation. Thus metaphysical knowledge, as well as the realization it implies in order to truly be what it ought to be, are possible everywhere and always, at least in principle, and when this possibility is regarded in a quasi-absolute sense, but in fact, in practice, so to speak, and in a relative sense, are they equally possible in just any environment and without making the least allowance for contingencies? On this score, we shall be much less affirmative, at least as concerns realization, and this can be explained by the fact that in its beginning, such a realization must take its support in the realm of contingencies. The conditions may be particularly unfavorable, such as those offered by the contemporary West, so much so that such a labor is almost impossible and can even be dangerous in the absence of any support offered by one's environment and in an ambiance that can only impede or even destroy the efforts of one who undertakes such a task. On the other hand, those civilizations that we call traditional are organized in a way that can actually prove an effective help, which no doubt is not strictly indispensable, any more than is anything else external, but without which it is however quite difficult to obtain effective results. Here is something that exceeds the strength of an isolated human individual, even if that individual happens to possess the requisite qualifications in other respects. Hence, we would not wish to encourage anyone in the present conditions to embark heedlessly upon such an undertaking, and this brings us to our conclusion. For us, the great difference between the East and West, meaning here exclusively the modern West, the only difference that is truly essential, since all the other differences are derivative, is this. On the one hand, preservation of tradition and all that it implies, and on the other hand, the neglect and loss of that same tradition. On the one side, the safeguarding of metaphysical knowledge. On the other, utter ignorance of all that relates to that realm. Between civilizations that open to their elite, such possibilities as we have tried to intimate, which give the most appropriate means to realize these possibilities effectively, and in the case of at least a few, to realize them fully, between those traditional civilizations and a civilization that has developed along purely material lines, how could a common measure be found? And who, unless he were blinded by I know not what prejudice, would dare claim that material superiority compensates for intellectual inferiority? When we say intellectual, we mean true intellectuality, that which is limited neither to the human nor to the natural order, that which makes pure metaphysical knowledge possible in its absolute transcendence. A moment's reflection on these questions seems to me sufficient to leave no doubt or hesitation as to the appropriate answer in response. The material superiority of the West is beyond dispute. Nobody denies it, but it is hardly grounds for envy. But one must go further. Sooner or later, this excessive material development threatens to destroy the West if it does not recover itself in time, and if it does not seriously consider a return to the source, as goes a saying current in certain schools of Islamic esoterism. Today one hears from many quarters of the defense of the West, but unfortunately, it does not seem to be understood that it is chiefly against itself that the West needs to be defended. That the greatest and most formidable of the dangers that threaten it stem from its own present tendencies. It would be wise to meditate deeply on this, and one cannot urge this too strongly on all who are still capable of reflection. So it is with this that I will end my account, glad if I have succeeded in giving a sense, if not a full understanding, of that Eastern intellectuality that no longer has any equivalent in the West, and if I have been able to provide a glimpse, imperfect though it may be, of what true metaphysics is, knowledge par excellence, which alone, as the sacred texts of India say, is completely true, absolute, infinite, and supreme.